some minor problems with overheating. And of course, him having to follow that Porsche so close uh, will obviously exacerbate that if it is a problem. And if they're going to have a heating problem, today could be a day for it, because it is extremely warm here at Lime Rock. Now that that battle has settled down a little bit, we'll check in with Tom Kendall back on the point. Tom is Kendall is about to lap Raul Bassell in the Jaguar and the number 98 car of, of Rocky, Rocky Moran. Moran. Those are eighth and ninth. Moran is eighth, Raul Bazell is ninth, and here comes Tommy Kendall. I can't get over this. He is rocketing around this racetrack. Now then, Raul Bazell won't Ooh. be looking for him either. I, I can't imagine that Raul Bazell would even imagine for a moment. Oh, he puts a wheel off. Tommy Kendall would be there yet. When you have that much power, that much ability right underneath your foot, I would imagine it emboldens you a little bit. You're going to try to pass anywhere you can if you think you're that much quicker than the guy ahead of you. Tommy Kendall seems to be amazingly uh, mature for a guy of his age, and I, I don't think he's going to make a mistake, but he is still awfully young. Tommy Kendall already proven himself as a champion, but still looking for that first victory in the GTP cars. The Intrepid has been impressive all weekend, much quicker than the competition. We asked Tommy Kendall where it's coming from. Well, the car is really good under braking and it just produces a tremendous amount of downforce. And so uh, all the mid, mid corner speeds are quite a bit higher, I think. And this track, even though there's a pretty good straightaway, there's a long corner that leads onto it. So uh, we're really not giving much away straightaway speed wise either because we can carry so much speed onto it. That was Rocky Moran's undoing too when Tom Kendall slipped by on the inside. It, it put Rocky Moran on. Now let's get down to Chris McClure. Well, quite obviously, Tom Kendall has adapted quickly. Jim Miller, he only had about an hour testing before coming to this track. A remarkable adaptation to the car. Well, I think Tommy has always proven to be a flexible driver, and uh, when we tested last week, he did very well, and he was right on the pace when we arrived here. Was there any additional incentive, given that he had pole at West Palm and lost the lead almost immediately to the man that started today on his flank, Davy Jones? Let's just say Tommy paid a great deal of attention to his experience. And I think he handled it pretty well. The Jaguars now running nose to tail on the racetrack, although Raul Bozell about to be lapped by his teammate. We've got action on the front straightaway. Car number six, four. I beg your pardon. That is Brian Bonner out of Boston, Massachusetts, racing on his home track here at Lime Rock. He has got a fire, a lot of smoke out of the car. And Brian Bonner out of the car as well. Good move there. That car burning pretty furiously at the rear, but they've got fire extinguishers on it now. That is one of Tom Milner's Chevrolet Spices, one of the older Spice cars with a normally aspirated Chevrolet engine, very much like the one in the Intrepid. But the Intrepids have taken a lot more engineering support from the Chevrolet Motor Division. They have very trick engine management systems called the Gen 3, and they are out there flying. Now you're on board with overall Camel GT points leader Chip Robinson. Little bit of breakup on this hazy day that makes it hard to bounce signals off our helicopter overhead. That is David Tennyson's Denon Spice Ferrari being passed by one of the Toyotas leading up to the chicane. Now, from here on, these GTP cars develop such incredible downforce. Ah, oh, see, we've gone from one car to another. That's pretty quick. Oh, now we've gone back to the other car. This is exciting, folks. Onto the main straight. You can see how... I'm sure we will see it before too long, David. This is James Weaver in the pits. That's got to be an early stop for the Porsche. But well, there is no driver change, so I assume James is still uh, feeling good in the car. Maybe his tires started to go off, or they could have used a softer compound and they wanted to, or something like that. It's just he, an early stop, very early. He was in seventh position when he stopped. Tommy Kendall and the number 65 Chevrolet-powered Intrepid from Miller Motorsports in Illinois has absolutely grabbed this race, race by the throat from the get-go. He has led every lap thus far. He has. Davy Jones is not very far behind. Just a few seconds. And of course, there's a long way to go yet. They've both got to make at least one stop. It's hot, but I would, I would hazard a guess the Intrepid is probably being kinder to his tires here than the Jaguar. Three and a half seconds, the gap from this car, Tommy Kendall, back to Davy Jones in the second place Jaguar. Behind Jones, it is Chip Robinson in the Nissan, Juan Fangio in the Toyota, Jeff Brabham in the Nissan, then Wayne Taylor in the second Chevy Intrepid, who has made his way up from the back of the pack. 
Raul Bozell and the Jaguar runs seventh, followed by Rocky Moran in another Toyota. John Hotchkiss Jr. in a normally aspirated Pontiac Spice car. And finally, James Weaver in a Porsche. There is the number 99 car of Juan Fangio with Jeff Brabham just behind the three-time defending Camel GT champion. Juan Fangio, a new father this weekend. His girlfriend Viviana gave birth to young Juan. Don't call me Juan Fangio, Fangio. During qualifying on Saturday. How terribly inconsiderate. He will be known as Juan Fangio, not Juan Manuel Fangio. Juan's uncle, of course, is the great five-time former world driving champion. The two products of Japan there, the V6 engine Nissan of Jeff Brabham, 83, the 99 Toyota, which, as I said earlier, is the smallest engine in the race. Two liter, 2.1 liter, four cylinder, turbocharged, but they chuck an awful lot of boost to it and give staggering horsepower and uh, has put up a very good account for itself last year particularly, but this year, the 99 and the 98 car just haven't been going quite as well. They took a sabbatical, they missed a couple of races, but they're back here today and obviously going very well against their old nemesis, the Nissan, but of course a new one has arisen now, and that is the intrepid Chevrolet is so fast around here at uh, Lime Rock. Jeff Brabham in the number 83 red, white, and blue Nissan closing up a little bit on Fangio with the help of that Pontiac Spice up ahead of John Hotchkiss Jr. And there, just, there's the 48 car, there's the Acura. Uh, more Japanese engineering, that of course is a Honda engine, a V6 also, four valve in a Spice chassis. And these guys are determined to go into Formula into GTP racing with a bigger engine yet. We saw Brian Bonner catch fire near the pit lane earlier. Now Chris McClure has more. Well, Brian Bonner did just get back to the pit and consulted with Tom Milner, the owner. Unfixable, I guess. Yeah, uh, we figure it's an oil leak from either an oil cooler or a, a valve cover gasket. We had a problem with uh, the valve cover gasket earlier this weekend. And it's uh, really too bad because Applebee's car was running great and I was just taking it easy. We had moved up from the back of the pack and we were running a good pace. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know the thing was burning because I saw the, the corner workers holding the fire bottles over the head and I figured it was somebody else. I'm looking at my mirrors to see a burning car and I realized it was mine. So uh, that's too bad, bad way to end the day. Well, at least he didn't have far to walk to get back to the Tom Milner Racing Pits. Number 98, Rocky Moran, all six foot one inch, 210 pounds of him. Rocky is a big guy. I raced against Rocky for nearly 20 years ago, now in Formula 5000. He certainly uh, hung in there extremely well. This year was the first in many that Rocky Moran was not in Indianapolis. He has driven at the speedway for many years, but he is one of Dan Gurney's favorite drivers. He will be with the Toyota Eagle program through its new iteration when that new car comes online very soon. And it is a very different car. Wait till you see it. And of course, it's going to need to be very effective uh, if today's demonstration by the Intrepid Chevrolet is going to go by. And of course, the Jaguar. The Jaguar is going extremely strong. There is the 84 Nissan. Chip Robinson running third on the racetrack. Jim Robinson, of course, leading this year's point standing with 88 points to his teammate Jeff Brabham, 82. Uh, Jeff Brabham, of course, having won the championship for the last three years. There you see a good in-car shot as we go on the no-name straight. You can see how unstraight it is. Into that climbing right-hander. Now, they used to just blast straight over the top there until John Morton had a huge flip. There's Rocky Moran just in front of him, pulling away a little bit as they come out of that corner. This is those two very fast right-handers, West Bend there, right to the edge of the road, under the bridge, down this hill. It's a lot steeper than it looks from the onboard camera. Out onto the straight, you can see how the wheel's twitching his hand, and that's just going straight. That's just bumps making him do that. Up to about 155, 160 miles an hour, hard on the brakes into turn one. As you can see, it's a double apex. There is Chip Robinson, who we spoke to before the race. IMSA has been racing here at Lime Rock since 1972, and GTP cars have undergone a massive evolution since then. We asked him whether the cars are too good for the track. I've been this race track for a number of years now, and uh, you know it's a short, narrow, tiny place, and and rough. And our cars just tend to bounce all over the racetrack, and it's a uh, it's a really difficult place for us. Uh, you know, it's in a way it's a shame because it's such a great area of the country to come to. I mean, I love the area, and and every time we come. You know, the facilities here look better. You know, they're building new buildings all the time, and it really looks nice, but the track itself is just a little 
a little uh, behind the times, I think, is for, for our cars. Well, Chip Robinson should know. He has driven all of the state-of-the-art cars in Camel GT Racing, but for perhaps the Toyota just ahead of him right now. Tom Kendall is your leader over Davy Jones, and we'll be right back to Lime Rock. Very lucky he didn't get his head knocked off, because if you saw it, the wheel off that other crash bounced around, hit his front wheel, and could so easily have hit him on the head. But that's not going to happen by the look of things to Tom, Tom Kendall. There's 64, that's Wayne Taylor in the second of the Intrepid Chevrolets. Unfortunately had to start at the back. Now latched onto the tail of uh, the lead of the race, his teammate, Tommy Kendall. He's a lap down on Tommy Kendall, unbelievable as it is, but look, he's in fourth spot and a lap down on the leader. These cars are going to be tough. Watkins Glen may not suit them quite so well. It's a very long straight with the Jaguar and the Nissan will like. But, uh, boy, they're going to go through the S's onto the straight there so quickly. And as Tommy said in that interview earlier on, it's entry speed onto the straight is a big part of it. Oh, see little traffic down there. It's yeah, got big. between one of the Milner cars. I believe that's uh, Jeff Herner, driving instructor at Road Atlanta in the blue car. Whoops, John Hotchkiss off the racetrack. This is in uh, Big Bend, I think. That's John Hotchkiss, Jr., who raced with my son Greg a few times in Formula 3 in England and a little bit of Barbasar here. And uh, they saw quite a bit of each other. John Hotchkiss, of course, comes from California. Did well to wait his turn, as you see young John there. His father is his co-driver in this car. We may see John Hotchkiss Sr. a little later on. We have three cars on the lead lap. Tommy Kendall, Davy Jones in the Jaguar, Chip Robinson in the Nissan. This car of Hotchkiss was running in ninth place at the time, probably lost the position on the racetrack. There are the matched Chevy Intrepids, 64 car, second in line there. One lap down is Wayne Taylor. Tommy They've Kendall. now got about a half a lap near enough as they go through that first of the S's. Davy Jones just went past our commentary point. That's about uh, a third of a lap uh, advantage. Tommy Kendall seems to be good in traffic. Davy Jones is braver than Dick Tracy, and he's good in traffic. Tommy Kendall just gives that terribly, terribly uh, nice guy demeanor, but the guy in traffic is something else, and um, and he's got the car to do it with. Terrific response from this big Chevrolet six-liter, six, uh, 366 cubic inch, tremendous torque, very, very good horsepower, instant response, and all the grip in the world to make it work. And boy, he is making it work. This is the corner, Big Ben, where these two cars are absolutely mind-blowingly quick. Everybody else. 64 Wayne Taylor has a tremendous sports car reputation in Europe, but he's evenly matched with Tommy Kendall, who started racing in IMSA Racing in 1964. There you see Wayne. He's bought himself a house down in Altamont Springs, Florida, for he and his wife and his two children, including new Jordan Lee, born just about 10 days ago. See how good they are through that chicane, too. They're not, none of that bouncing around that the other people. These cars use Penske shocks. Roger Penske, of course, so well known to Indy viewers. Yes, they won again. And they have developed a shock absorber system that a lot of people use on their race cars. And they certainly seem to be doing the trick here. The car is noticeably better on damping than any other car out there. You saw James Weaver. There he is, hitting Rob Dyson's car. Looks as though James will get out. Yep, that's him. Rob Dyson, the car owner, will get in. Well, when you're not doing very well, I mean, quite frankly, they're running sort of towards the back of the pack in 10th spot. Um, and if you're not feeling very well, and there's obviously no real point to be gained in leaving James out there, although he's considerably quicker than Rob Dyson, uh, if he's not feeling very well, there's no point in him just staying there all afternoon. Well, they'll have a new car online before too long, and maybe it will take technology another step further. Oh, Davy Jones there. Being carved up by the... Hugh Fuller, Mike Allison sharing that Buick-powered spice. Hugh Fuller out of Auburn, Alabama started it. Whoop, John Hotchkiss then, Jr. I, off again. I suspect that either John Hotchkiss is getting tired, but that's exactly the same spot, almost to the inch, or his tires are going away. He will get back on the racetrack. He has a little bit of a gap, but not much of one. Here's another look. Oh, seems like he may have got uh, tagged. Uh, he tried to turn in. The number yeah. nine of Jim Pace was underneath him. It really left him nowhere to go. Rode him right to the outside oh. of the track. Now, Jim Pace in the number nine car is running in 15th, and uh, that's the sort of thing that's inclined to get up your nose because he was being lapped by Hotchkiss in the Camel Light car, 
and he tried to uh, be clever and got inside John Hotchkiss and uh, pushed Hotchkiss off the road again. And it is, to say the least, extremely irritating. The gap more than 15 seconds from the first place car of Tom Kendall to this man.